you have your Bible this morning, open to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Thankful to see each of you here today. I know there's some sickness around. We're thankful that you were able to be here. Isaiah chapter 7. Now last Sunday that I announced that uh, I felt led for the three Sundays that we had left in the morning services on Sunday uh, to uh, try to preach a series of messages based on a passage of Scripture in the book of Luke, chapter 2, that the message was given to the shepherds, that unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And I said that we would title the series, A Savior, Christ the Lord. And the burden of my heart is that in looking at these things, that uh, if you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you would see that He truly is the Savior. He is the gift of God. He is the Son of God. But there will be no doubt in your mind that He's the one that from eternity past that God chose to send into this world to pay the ultimate price and to be our Savior. And it's one thing just to, you know, believe the facts about Him coming. It's another thing to trust Him with all your heart and to accept Him uh, as your Savior. And that's ultimately uh, my desire in trying to bring these things out that you would see that you know, if God sent a Savior, evidently I needed one. And that if I reject the Savior, uh, that, uh, you know, there's no hope for me, but that there is a hope in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And last Sunday morning, with the help of the Lord, tried to read a verse of Scripture from Isaiah chapter 40 and uh, point out the Old Testament prophecies concerning the fact that before the Savior would come, that one would come just before Him, and He would prepare the way for the Lord. The scripture said it like this, uh, that uh, the crooked places would be made straight, the rough places would be made smooth, that the valleys would be exalted in every mountain and hill, uh, that they would be uh, brought down. In other words, that there would be no hindrances uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ coming in into this world. And uh, the Bible spoke, Isaiah spoke of that one who would come, that forerunner who would come, and uh, that he would come in the, in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And he would come to turn the hearts of the people uh, unto uh, the Lord. Uh, and we looked last Sunday morning, in fact, that as we were driving up this morning, that the radio program came on. I listened to a few minutes of the, I don't like to listen to myself preaching, but listened to a few minutes of the sermon from last Sunday morning, this morning driving up. And uh, I reminded you of the fact that there's 400 years between Malachi and Matthew and while a lot of times those are referred to as 400 silent years, and they were, that God wasn't speaking to mankind during those years through a prophet, yet he was doing a wonderful work. He was preparing things for Christ to come into this world. And I may have mentioned this last Sunday morning. Let me say this, and then we'll read our, our scripture for this morning. Uh, that everything was in place when Christ came into the world for the gospel message to go into all the world. That the Roman Empire was then in power. That there was a, a pretty much a worldwide language. The Greek language was spoken and understood throughout the world. There was a system of roads that were, uh, that were uh, constructed by the Roman government. So really, that, uh, this was the best time. There was peace throughout the world, the Pax Romana. And it was a time that, uh, when the gospel could go without hindrances uh, into the world. And so this morning, I want to continue with that in Isaiah chapter 7. And uh, I want to read one verse of Scripture here in verse 14. And let me say this before we read, that if Isaiah... Is going, was going to be the, or not Isaiah, John the Baptist is going to be the forerunner. That means that there's one coming right after him. So when John the Baptist comes, when this messenger, when this forerunner comes, that right behind him that we can be looking for the Savior. And that's the whole point of what I tried to get across to us last Sunday morning, that this is God's plan and his purpose and and we ought to see beyond a shadow of a doubt that the one who's born in Bethlehem there that night is the Son of God. He is the Savior. So one would come, it, it, he would come very quickly, very soon. He would come imminently behind uh, the forerunner. Verse 14, we see the prophecy concerning uh, how uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ would come into the world. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name 
Emmanuel. Now, I'm, I'm just going to read that one verse of Scripture. Now, you can go back and look at the context of this. And uh, Isaiah was, uh, he was speaking to a king at that time uh, by the name of Ahaz. And uh, that Ahaz was a very faithless man. He was not a man who uh, believed in God. And, and uh, the, the, basically Isaiah had told him, God will do something for you if you'll trust in him. And, and he said, if you don't believe him, ask for a sign. And, and Ahaz said, I'm not going to ask for a sign. And so then the prophet would tell him, the Lord's going to give you a sign. And here's what he's going to do. A virgin shall conceive. That's unique, isn't it? Oh, there's never been a virgin that, that conceived before or since. There never will be. But a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And notice what he would be called. He would be called Emmanuel. And of course, Emmanuel means God with us. Let's go to the New Testament, to the book of Luke, chapter 1. We're going to do a little bit more reading than we did last week. and I know maybe this is more of a study than a message, but again, that you can see that Jesus, this one that was born, he is the Savior. He is the Savior. So Isaiah, uh, Isaiah prophesied that the virgin would conceive and bring forth a son. Isaiah prophesied the forerunner would come. So now that the message has been given to, to Zacharias, look at that last week as he's in the temple and he is uh, doing service there as a priest there at the altar of incense that the angel Gabriel would come and he would speak to him and he would let him know that you're going to be a father, your wife is going to conceive and she's going to give birth to a son and he's going to be this forerunner. Now this has taken place and so now that we need to look right after that, we need to look for the Messiah, the Savior to come into the world. So Luke chapter 1, uh, let's go down to verse 26. I left off of verse 25 last Sunday morning. So let's pick up with verse 26 this morning. I'm going to read several verses without stopping. I don't want to break it up, but then I want to go back and uh, look at some things that we see here in these uh, verses of Scripture. Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 26. So uh, I keep saying Isaiah. Zacharias, Zacharias has gone back home to Elizabeth that she has conceived. And she's now a child. Verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now that's down through verse 38. Keep your Bible open there. I want to read on here in just a minute. But I want to go back and look at this particular paragraph. I've read uh, a paragraph to you uh, concerning... And the message that came uh, to Mary. And there's several things I want to point out to you, what we just read. The first thing I want to point out to you is this, that God sent Gabriel again on a special mission, didn't he? If you'll remember last week, and I just reminded you of this, that as, as Zacharias is in there in the, in the temple in the holy place, that he looks up and he's afraid. And he sees something like he had never seen before. And he, he supposed that this was an angel, and it was, it was Gabriel. And Gabriel said, look, I've been sent from God, that I'm Gabriel who dwell, I dwell in the presence of God. I'm that messenger. We know there's a lot of angels 
And in fact, the Bible speaks of an innumerable company of angels. You can't number the angels. And I believe this, and my study's not on angels this morning, but people are people and angels are angels. And people don't become angels. When a little child dies, that little child does not become an angel. That sounds good, doesn't it? That sounds sweet. That sounds comforting. If a child dies, that that child has now become an angel. But that child's not become an angel. That angels were created back before mankind was created. And they're ministering spirits, the Bible tells us, to do the work of God. And we know a third of them fell in rebellion, that they followed Lucifer, uh, who uh, was a, a, a great angel. And uh, th that he desired to be, a, a, to be a, above God, didn't want to be... Uh, uh, surrendered to God and, and to do God's will. Uh, but we know that, uh, that Gabriel is one of those that are mentioned in the Bible. There's a couple of angels that are still uh, God's angels that are mentioned, Gabriel and Michael. And So Gabriel's now sent the first time he went to the temple. Now don't you notice where he went this time? It tells us that Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. I'm glad that angels just go, and they do. And they don't ask questions, but they just go in obedience to God. Because Nazareth was not a place, no doubt, that Gabriel... Nazareth was not a place anybody wanted to go. In fact, that in the scriptures over the book of Acts that uh, you find uh, even as Paul would be accused there before the people, they, they made this statement about him uh, that he was part of a sect that had a ringleader who was a Nazarene. They're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was, he was raised in Nazareth. Uh, <laughs> I think Nazareth was, I don't mean to be offensive this morning, if you've Maybe you're from this place, but it would be about like saying that, that God telling an angel, you know, you go down to Delo, and that's where the Savior's going to be born. Someplace like that. You go to Nazareth. Go to Nazareth. Nazareth was a despised city. It was a little village. That I read this concerning Nazareth. It was so small that they only had one well in town. There was a well there. That's where people drew the water from. Just a small little village. What did, uh, was it, wasn't it Nathaniel that made the statement, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, come and, come and see. Come and see. So this despised village, Gabriel was sent there, and I want you to see something else. That's where Mary and Joseph were living. Well, they weren't living together at this time because it, uh, well, they were spouse. They weren't. They, they were, that marriage hasn't taken place. We'll deal with that more in a minute. But brother Allen, people like to blame their circumstances on their environment a lot of times, don't they? I am. You know, I, I am the person I am because here's what I was brought up in. You young people sitting here on the first row, and and some of you others scattered throughout the house. Mary and Joseph were some of the finest young people there's ever been. And they were young. I think Mary was probably just a teenager. You ever thought about that? They got married young in those days. She was probably some of y'all's age, you ladies down here on this end. Just a teenage girl. She was raised in Nazareth. And Nazareth was not only just a despised place, not only because the people were poor there, but it was... Well, Galilee was spoken of Galilee of the Gentiles. There were a lot of Gentiles that were mixed in there. It really wasn't a very morally upright place. Nazareth was not. And yet here's two godly Christian young people there. And so Gabriel sent there on this special mission. The second thing I want you to see in this passage of Scripture is this, that the Virgin Mary is chosen of God. The Virgin Mary is chosen of God of God. As I said, she's just a teenage girl and she's espoused to a carpenter. And his name is Joseph. 
And the way that this worked, that we, we'd like to, a lot of times we compare it to an engagement, and it was very much like an engagement, but it was even more binding than an engagement. If a person, if, if a couple today, if a, a young boy and a young girl, if they're engaged today, and uh, maybe there's things that he, he just decides she's not the one, or she decides he's not the one, they can break that off and no big deal, you know, hopefully she'll give the ring back. <laughs> and you move on. But the espousal in those days was much different, that it was legally binding, that uh, in fact you'll, you'll notice a statement over in the book of Matthew, as we'll read here in a few minutes, that it spoke, speaks of Joseph at this time as her husband. Legally he was her husband at this time. They did not live together, they did not know one another in the way of a, a married couple. But if she was unfaithful to him, that he would have to give her a divorce and she could actually be stoned to death. If she was found to be unfaithful to him. Because in the eyes of the law that they were married. And so Gabriel sent here to this town of Nazareth and to this virgin. And says this, this in verse 27. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And so Gabriel goes to her. And I'm going to just summarize it because we've already read it. He said, Mary, he said, thou art highly favored of God. He said, God has chosen you to give birth to the Savior. And what was her question? How can this be? I don't know. See, and I know not a man. There's no way that I can give birth because that I'm a virgin. And Gabriel told her, said in verse 35, said, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, and that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Well, Gabriel, in essence, told her this is going to be an immaculate conception. And that satisfied her, didn't it? She was satisfied with that. And she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Mary knew that this was going to cause her life to be changed, to be different. But she counted it as an honor. This is not the thought of the message this morning. But how many of us think it an honor for our lives to be changed because God's got something for us to do? A lot of times we look at that as, oh well, that's going to cost me. But she didn't look at it that way. That I have been chosen. God's chosen me to be the mother of the Savior. The third thing I want to point out to you is this. That Gabriel did something to her. God did something for her. To encourage her. How did God encourage Mary? He said, you know your cousin Elizabeth? Yeah. Yeah. She's old, yeah. She's expecting a baby. Because that was something impossible. In fact, the statement is made, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. She's expecting, and she's six months along, and she's going to give birth. And that was encouraging to Mary. That if God can do it for Elizabeth, that she can do it for me. She willingly submitted herself to the plan of God. Now go down to verse 39. Let's follow this on. It says, And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation, and the word salutation means greeting, as soon as you spoke to me, as soon as you greeted me, as soon as the salutation sounded in mine ear, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. 
And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For, behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imaginations of their heart. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away empty. He hath opened his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now let's stop and look at some things that we see here in this passage of Scripture. As soon as, I'm going to tell you what I believe here. I believe as soon as Mary submitted herself to the Lord, I believe it was then the Holy Ghost overshadowed her and she conceived. I believe that that happened very, very quickly. Maybe almost immediately. But when Mary heard that her cousin Elizabeth was expecting, she left Nazareth. And it says she went into the hill country of Judea. Evidently, they lived somewhere pretty close to Jerusalem. Zacharias and Elizabeth. And that's what I just read to you, what happened that when she arrived. And there's a few things I want to point out from this passage of Scripture, just like I did about the last one. And the first thing I want us to see from this passage of Scripture is this, that that was a day of rejoicing. It was a day of rejoicing. It was a day of rejoicing on many fronts. The first thing that I want us to be reminded of is the joy of the unborn child. Who was that unborn child that Elizabeth was carrying? John the Baptist, wasn't it? It was the forerunner. The first time that John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ came face to face. The first time that John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ were in the presence of one another. It says this, go back and look. Uh, in verse 41 that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary when Mary walked in the house and she greeted her it said the babe leaped in her womb the babe leaped in her womb now I know that babies move around in the womb but this was different wasn't it Elizabeth had never experienced anything like this before. She knew this was something special. The babe leaped for joy in her womb when when, when the babe heard the greeting of Mary. So the unborn child rejoiced at the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only did the unborn child rejoice, we see that Elizabeth rejoiced. Look at verse 42. It said, she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. I tell you, this was a joyful occasion. Elizabeth knew something great was happening inside of her, but evidently that God had revealed unto her that something great was also happening inside of her cousin Mary. And she said, Blessed art thou, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And notice what she said in verse 43. She said, And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth not only saw it as an honor for for Mary to be given birth to to the Messiah, but for Mary to come into her house. I'm going to use this example, and it's, it, it's, not even, it's not even close to the excitement, but just to get the point across to you, uh, when I was a kid, my dad pastored a church, and it was in Alabama, and uh, there was an older lady there, and she had a house full of kids. Of course, they were all grown and had their own children at that time. She was probably in her 70s at this time, and, but uh, it, her house was a place that we ate many meals on Sunday. It was just one of those places that she cooked and all the kids came over every Sunday. And just out in the country and we, we would go a lot of times, they'd invite us to come eat with them. And I don't know how many times I heard this statement made. Preacher, I, of course I wasn't a preacher, my daddy was, but talking to my daddy, preacher, you see that chair right there? That's where Bear Bryant sat when he come to recruit my boy. You see, one of her sons was a standout football player and Bear Bryant had come and eaten dinner in her home back in the 60s. And they hadn't forgotten it. That was exciting to them. 
But I tell you what, that doesn't compare to the Lord Jesus Christ coming into your home. As I said, that's no comparison. And don't leave here and say the preacher compared Bear Bryant to the Lord. I didn't. <laughs> I'm saying it has no comparison to that. Elizabeth's so excited because the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ would come to her house. She said, she tells her this, that look, as soon as you spoke to me, that the babe leaped in my womb. And she recognized Mary's great faith in God. Notice the statement in verse 45. And this is a statement we all need to remember. She said, blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Do you believe that today, that there will be a performance of what the Lord says unto you, what he says he will do? And that's what Elizabeth encourages her with. Mary, that what, he, what he said he was going to do, he's going to do. There's going to be a performance. So there's the joy of the unborn child. There's the joy of Elizabeth. And then we find the joy of Mary in verse 47. Mary said this, or verse 46, My soul doth magnify the Lord. My soul's giving praise unto God. I, Mary was overflowing, wasn't she? She, she? she didn't know what to do with herself. Elizabeth was overflowing with joy. As I said, they were drinking out of the saucer, weren't they? My soul doth magnify the Lord. And look at this, verse 47. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. You see, Mary had a Savior. She had a Savior. God was her Savior. And then she said this in verse 48. She just couldn't believe it. He has regarded the lowest state of his handmaid. <laughs> me from Nazareth, just poor, lowly, yet God's chosen me. Don't you think that because that you're not famous or because you don't have a certain last name, you don't have a certain amount of money, God can't use you? No, he uses the lowly, doesn't he? The humble. God's chose me. She said, you know, from henceforth, from now on, all generations shall call, call me blessed. Notice what she said in verse 49. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things. I thought about that song we sing. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. And that's what Mary said that day. To God be be the glory. Of course, she went on and spoke of all the things that the Lord had done for her. And it says in verse 56 that Mary abode with her about three months and then returned to her own house. So she stays with Elizabeth for three months. By this time that, that it's time for Elizabeth to give birth uh, to her son. And I'm not going to go into that this morning. We dealt with the forerunner last week. But you can go on and read in, in the rest of Luke chapter 1. And you find that she does. She gives birth unto him. And of course, all the people say, we're going to name him Zacharias. And you remember, Zacharias still can't talk. He would have rejoiced that day. He was rejoiced on the inside. He just couldn't get it out. But he'll rejoice later on in the chapter. And finally, he, he writes down, his name's John. And his tongue is loosed. And he rejoices. Let's go back to the last place this morning. I want to read back to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. So Mary comes back. To Nazareth. She's been gone for three months. And she comes back and she's expecting a child. <clears throat> you reckon the tongues were wagging in Nazareth? You know they were. Let's read it. Verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, notice how he put that, Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of hers of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, this is where we started this morning, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, is being, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, we find in this passage of Scripture, we find a, man, a young man, 
in a predicament, don't we? You talk about a man that was... We, we make, the saying, or say the, make the statement between a rock and a hard place. Or, this was a man that was torn. This was a man that probably experienced something like he had never experienced before. You ever have something happen, just your, your heart just sinks. Your stomach's in knots. That's all you can think about. Well, you think about Joseph for a minute. He's had his eye on Mary for a long time. And the espousal was a, a year, from what I understand. And so he's making preparations. He's getting the house together. He's make, doing everything so that when that year's over, he'll go get his bride. And they'll be officially married. The marriage will be consummated. And that they'll go to have their own household. She's been gone for three months. And now she comes back and she's expecting. And notice how the scripture says it in verse 18 the last statement she was found with child of the Holy Ghost Joseph didn't know that she was with child of the Holy Ghost he knew she was with child in verse 19 then Joseph her husband being a just man he was a righteous man he was a, a man who uh, had a savior he believed in God notice what it said about him that he was not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privately. What does that say about, her, about him and her? He loved her, didn't he? All he had to do was to take her to the judges of the city and say, we're espoused, and she's expecting stone her. And under the law that she would be stoned, she'd be killed. But oh, he loved that girl. And I believe that Joseph, he's thinking in his mind, that's so unlike her. That's not her nature. That's not, how, that's not how she operates. She's a good girl. That's why I chose her. She, she's, she's a godly uh, young lady. That with all her heart, she tries to please God. She fears God. But the evidence is there. She, she's expecting. But look at the first phrase of verse 20. I love this. But while he thought on these things. I saw something in this I'd never seen before. Joseph didn't go run his mouth about Mary, did he? I know the Bible says that in the multitude of counselors there's wisdom and a lot of people use that to gossip, don't they? I don't think he told a soul But he thought on these things. He pondered these things. I believe Joseph spent a lot of time in prayer. He, sought a lot, he, he spent a lot of time seeking God's will. What do I do? I know what the law says. What do I do? And it says, while he thought on these things, God gave him an answer. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. I don't know if this is Gabriel. Gabriel certainly... Uh, is named in the other instances but the angel appeared to him a dream and said Joseph thou son of David fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife for that which is conceived in hers of the Holy Ghost as Joseph pondered on it God gave him an answer God gave him uh, the answer God gave him the answer concerning several things first of all the origin of the child he said that which is conceived in hers of the Holy Ghost She's not been unfaithful to you. And he went on and gave, her the, uh, gave him the name of the child. It said in verse 21, She shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus. And then he told uh, Joseph concerning the work of the child, He shall save his people from their sin. And then he reminded him of the prophecy of the child that was given in Isaiah chapter 7. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So you think about that. Joseph had a choice then, didn't he? He can believe God, or he can listen to probably what people are saying, and he believes God. 
It said, being raised from sleep, he did exactly what the Lord told him to do. And he took unto him his wife. And I think the tongue still wagged in Nazareth. But verse 25 is very important. The marriage was not consummated until after the Lord Jesus Christ was born. Why is that important? Because if there's a possibility that Jesus was born of Joseph and Mary, he may not be the Son of God. But there's no possibility. Jesus was conceived of the Holy Ghost in the womb of Mary. Now, what I've tried to share with you this morning is a unique story. It's a unique account. You'll never read another one like this. The reason it's unique is because it, we have a unique Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the only one. He is so unique. I could, I could stand up here for hours and hours and hours and just take you to places in the Scriptures and point out things to, how, and to show you just how unique the Lord Jesus Christ is. But above everything else, I want you to realize that he's the Savior. The reason he is unique is because he stands out as the Savior, the Son of God. He's the one that God sent into the world so that we could have everlasting life. And you need a Savior. Everybody sitting here needs a Savior. From the pulpit to the door, we all need a Savior. And God's provided a Savior. The question is... Have you accepted God's gift of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ? We're going to stop there this morning. Lord willing, if the Lord allows us to live, we're going to look at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ next week. And the things surrounding his birth, all the unique things that happen surrounding his birth, and I trust beyond a shadow of a doubt that all of you would not only just believe that Jesus is the Christ, but that you would accept the Lord Jesus as the Christ and as your Savior. Let's have a verse of a song. If there's something.